it's almost like different populations and whole experiences and how to bring those together. Mm -hmm. I was just thinking that um, it's critical to like everyone on campus because we live in a siloed world mm -hmm. and that every chance we have to dialogue to, you know, or generally the undergrad population, they're still <laughs> learning, mm -hmm. the brains are still literally developing and like just engaging with us in dialogue uh, helps them grow. And that's huge. Thank awesome. you. Thank you so much. Does anyone, one last person online would like to share? No pressure. Sure, I've typed up a response. Um, my name's Lori, I work in the Office of Merit Awards, which is part of the Career Center. And we work very closely with students. Um, so dialogue is absolutely critical. Um, one of my concerns that I'm hoping to address today is kind of how to overcome the intimidation factor and and help students understand that they belong mm -hmm. in front of us um, and and that we are working to support them and help them to achieve their goals. Thank you so much, Lori. Okay, I think next for us is passing it off to Quinn. Um, to dive into the research behind dialogue. Um, some of you all named some of the things that we'll talk about. So that's it over to Quinn. Absolutely. Thank you, Chloe. Thank you, Allison. Um, so, of course, this is a snapshot of research, right? Um, there are scholarly articles popping up all the time about different modes of how we go about having dialogue, the different things that we're learning from the feedback and the assessments and and other tools that are being gathered to this population that we're having these conversations with. But to, to really bring it down to its nuts and bolts, um, all of this research has proven that dialogue is paramount. It is essential, it is a needed piece, mm -hmm. not just from a developmental standpoint, but thinking about the world that we live in. We are living in very divisive times. Everyone has their opinion and their opinion is the right opinion. But also the reality is, is that others can hold truths that may be different than our truth, but both can coexist at the same time. Dialogue makes that possible, and this research has proven that. Additionally, it allows us to narrow down our scope um, in expanding dialogue as a higher learning tool, um, as an asset that promotes self-reflection and an understanding across difference. This goes into some of the work that we do as a center already. When helping students understand that you may believe that the third Harry Potter book is the best Harry Potter book, but someone else can also believe that the seventh is just as great because of the characters, because of the storyline. And there's not a negative to that. There's something that can be gathered and learned. But when you are coming into a space willing to be compassionate, willing to understand that things may exist a little bit more beyond just you, you can come in and use these different tools in a more meaningful way. Um, that still creates that sense of belonging, even though you're a part of team three and someone else is a part of team seven, right? Beyond that, research also shows that um, there is this commingling of intent versus impact and, and bias, right? This idea that we all have biases. Um, and it's not the work of dialogue or bias work to get rid of a bias, but it's to be aware of it. So if I'm walking into an environment and, you know, I am of the utmost conviction that Voldemort is a deeply misunderstood character, <laughs> um, and someone's like, no, Harry, like Snape was deeply understood. Voldemort was just evil, right? This idea that the bias that they may have reading the book, feeling the way that they do, shouldn't preclude anyone else from being able to share a truth either. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you recognize it, you move through it, you acknowledge it um, in a meaningful way and saying, I think I may have a bias here, but, you know, I haven't gotten to the sixth book, you know, Snape so hasn't had his redemption arc, right? Mm -hmm. um, or the seventh book or whatever the case may be. Um, and so allowing time and space to fit in that also movement of growth and expansion. Um, and so, again, um, new terms being introduced, this idea of expansion, all of this is very centric to what the research shows. But again, this just proves to be a snapshot 
But it's important because as Corey will let us know as we move into the actual having of the dialogue, this can serve as your frame. Mm -hmm. um, of, of how you can exist in this and what additional information you can provide to those that you're in this space with as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Before Corey gets started, I did want to kind of try and thread this a little bit for you all before we get into the actual dialogue. So one of the things I wanted to say about what we're going to be doing today and fostering um, what we're trying to do is provide a vehicle to foster a sense of belonging through this school of dialogue. Mm -hmm. And the way that you're able to do that is through a few things. We're gonna model it today. Um, and the team and I will take turns and kind of pointing out certain things to you all so that you can kind of tell like, this is the tool. So for example, what Corey will go into next in terms of like the dialogue guidelines. Mm -hmm. Now the guidelines that we will be giving to you all are not the same guidelines that you've given to your students, mm -hmm. to your staff or managers, this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And obviously like you all are educators, you know this. Um, so I just wanted to make that clear that in this dialogue, we'll be having the discussion, but also doing it in a way that models and showcase how it can happen and hopefully kind of answer some of these questions or follow up on some of the, the session outcomes that you all have speaking about, like mm -hmm. um, wanting to take away some of that pressure or the feelings that mm -hmm. come or the angst that comes with doing dialogue, how we actually do that. And we'll insert a lot of what happened earlier today with the gallery wall. So it will come together uh, but I just wanted to kind of frame that out for you all so you have that clarity first. Robin, our fearless leader, mm -hmm. <laughs> is in the room now. Um, did you want to add something, Robin? Oh, just uh, briefly to thread, as Danielle says, through all this, is that guidelines is what we want you to take away. That community standards and guidelines is what's critical. Um, with every step of this process, there is a customizing based on community that, that leads to the impact. So mm -hmm. the guidelines we might use with each other based on what we understand about the community might be, the, might be a different set of guidelines. Mm -hmm. um, we have some folks in here, I think, um, <laughs> like all great guidelines would be different than let's say a literacy program or a living learning community or a classroom. Mm -hmm. And so that's the piece we're really trying to hit home yeah. is less the content of it, we're gonna give you all some of the things that you will enjoy, but more so the, the concept must be a part of the the like the dialogue so it's here. Thank you so much for that team. Um so just to make note of it and like my lovely team members have said, um these guidelines, we're giving you these guidelines so that you have them as a part of the dialogical method, right? But if we had more time, we would come, we would create these together. So what is some community guidelines, some shared guidelines that we want to have in this space together? We do have like a set sort that we list out for students, but then we elicit like, okay, well, what do you all think should be in this space? Um, so with that being said, we have take space, take space, make space. Um, monitor your airtime, right? I think um, within this space, like if you've been talking a lot, know when to step back. And if you haven't been talking a lot, know when to step up. And I think we can do that with our students. It's like, hey, I haven't heard from, I don't know, I haven't heard from Xander today. What do you think about this? Or, you know, thank you for that. I know you have a lot of experience. Um, I wonder what you would think about insert this thing, this thing, this thing. Um, so just monitoring your airtime. What does that look like? Um, the next is ask for what you need, offer what you can. So um, once again, speak up if you're normally quiet. Um, allow for silence. You don't have to be the first person to share. Um, so that's kind of the, the, the gist of that one. Produce discomfort. This is a spicy one, I like this one. <laughs> um, so we want you to move from your comfort zone to your growth zone, right? I think a lot of the times we stay where we're comfortable, but there's not always a lot of growth and comfortability, right? Um, so what does it mean to push yourself to that level of, of um, your your growth zone where it's like, okay, I'm feeling a little uncomfortable, but I know that this is for my best bet, but not to the point where I'm panicking. Like I'm to the point where I'm, oh, I'm feeling um, overstimulated or my anxiety is high. Where can we find that sweet middle spot in this space, but also with our students? Um, the next one is curiosity and risk. 
Um, lessons leave, stories stay. So we know this, you know what I'm saying? If someone is like, hey, I went through this thing and it was insert whatever, whatever. I'm not going to go and say, oh yeah, Danielle went through this thing. And no, 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 Spilling Danielle business to all of you. <laughs> Nobody has time for that, <laughs> you know? Um, but more so like, what is the lesson from that? Like maybe it was perseverance. Maybe it was, oh, I utilized the writing center. Um, so the, the stories stay, but the lessons leave. Um, what's next? Learn, reflect, act, and repeat. Um, if you have a question, ask it. If you have an answer, even when imperfect, say it. Um, so we're all in this space to learn together. We're all in this space to re reflect um, from the things that we've learned together. And from those learnings and from those reflections, what can we do on our campus for our students, for our staff, for our faculty? Um, and how do we repeat it? How do we grow from it? Um, and then the next thing is cultivate practice, right? A lot of the times, um, I think we can talk about theory or we can talk about the actual action, but what does it look like um, for us to do those things together cohesively? So if we're talking about these dialogical guidelines, what does it look like not just to have them, but to actually practice them? So if you're in a meeting and you realize like, oh, I've been talking for the last 10 minutes, let me step back, right? Um, so yeah, did I miss anything, team? Um, no, I do want to add, however, just yeah. in given some of the comments that we have come up, one of the things that I know that we do as a team when we do guidelines, and sometimes I don't hear this as much, is asking the group what the challenge will be mm. when the guidelines are um, broached. Mm. So you give them the guide and say, okay, great, this is cool, but then asking the question, which one of these may be most challenging to you? And then how do we have a solve for that in the moment? So that the dialogue doesn't get stopped, mm -hmm. but we have a way to continue it and we all have agreed to it. So I know some people like to use ouch, you know, if someone says something, you know, ouch, that's a solve for a challenge that I might not be comfortable with advocating for myself right now. Or I might not be comfortable with saying the thing that it is, but I can say, ooh, Mm -hmm. I ain't like that. And then we can go into further dialogue. So I just wanted to make that mm -hmm. bit of a uh, point. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh -huh. um, with that being said, I will pass it on to my lovely colleague, Danielle. Yes. All right. So uh, any any comments or anything from the Zoom space? I just want to make sure we are keeping to you all as well if you had any comments. Yeah. Okay, so I'll ask my colleagues to join if we can, some uh -huh. space, if one or two of us can yeah. come to the circle. That's what I'm doing. Part of the dialogical process. <laughs> <laughs> Power dynamics are in tow, so we want to make sure they're... Um, so for this dialogue, as you can see here, Dialogue belonging at AU. And we have a quote here from one of our students in their voice. It says, Corey, can you read it for me? I don't want to turn my Yes. <laughs> it is hard to imagine that there are other students who feel othered and don't feel like they can say anything. We chose this quote because we felt that this touches a lot on what dialogue can mean for our students. And then for us too, in knowing the things that they may need or desire and how we can foster this sense of community for them. Um, obviously there's no guarantee in, you know, things like things like we can make the rainbows happen for you, but what we can do is provide a brave space like this so that they don't have this thought or these emotions of feeling or being other or they do and have a place to come to to express what that feels like and ways in which that they can um, uh, express it on campus. So in the beginning section of this, we all walked around and looked at these gallery questions. And if you noticed in all of these questions, these are personal to you, to your own experience. It uses the I statement, the me, first person, because what dialogue does in every sense is give you the opportunity to self-reflect first so that your experiences can be a part of the discussion, to be a part of the dialogue. 
Um, that's the only way the dialogue really works is if we insert ourselves and our experiences in the topic at hand um, so that we can find connection between each other. So what we're going to do as a team is we're going to go to each of these different questions and pull one or two comments from them. And from there, uh, we'll read them aloud and they kind of take some comments around each of these. And then we'll also take um, some from the Zoom space as well. Mm -hmm. um, so let's start off with the first question that we have, which is so how would I describe myself in one sentence without using gender, race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, et cetera? Let's I'm grab gonna, this from the Zoom. I'm gonna put the oh, questions back perfect. up so that they can see it. Great. Um, so for folks in the Zoom, um, we're answering the first question, um, and I'll just repeat. They may already have it in the chat. Oh, okay. I mean, thanks. And I also want to make the point here, too, that as we do this exercise, we're now moving from the self-reflection, the I, to the we, um, and incorporating how are we finding commonality and the topics that we're getting ready to discuss, and then the questions that we're going to move to next. All right. Would anyone in the Zoom like to give us a comment about this? Any thoughts around this? Moving from the I to the we. Well, this is a, a really a, an odd question. Okay, we have Justina who says, "I'm a potter and a reader." But I think the things you asked to leave out are important. Uh, <laughs> Most definitely. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's to get, mm -hmm. That's the point, um, Justina. Like, we have to give ourselves that, uh, what do we say, the discomfort mm -hmm. um, in figuring out how would I answer this question yeah. if I didn't have all of these identifiers to describe it. Yeah. I think the, the piece that's also critical and why we ask this question, especially given the work we do, right? The yeah. piece of all day, every day in, in thinking about these issues in the context of gender, race, ethnicity, and all the other pieces, because they're critically important. And for our students, um, that constantly feeling like I must define myself by something and the third, um, devoids them sometimes of their who they are. Being mm -hmm. seen and supported for their unique self and who they are. Um, and that's one of the first ways you can bring someone into the room. Mm -hmm. That, you know, I see you not because you have, you exist in these paradigms that you did not create, mm -hmm. but that the world created for you, that I now see you for your unique self. And so if, I, if we can do that with and for them together, then we start to start to chip away at some of the things that kind of put the distance between us. Okay, does anybody have anything to say? Yeah, I just want to react to that. Mm -hmm. um, I felt othered by not being able to speak to my gender, race, ethnicity, and sexual orientation because they define me so critically. And I feel like they are ways that I do connect with students. So to, to hear that with you, and I, I just want to put it out there, that was probably the hardest one for me because I kept being like, no, can't do that. No, no, no. Um, and so the intersectionality of all of that is really something I struggle with. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I love the struggle. <laughs> and that is dialogue. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. Not, not all the stuff when I say, but the struggle yeah. you feel inside of you when you do the struggle. I'll find myself back on this. Okay. Okay. Um, Taurus then. Cancer food, Capricorn rising, sea drinking, Jersey person who loves dogs, books, and cheese. That's a very grounding person. What are you? There it is. That's a lot of earth signs. You're just saying. Wow. Your big three. Yeah. Um, let's go to number three, Corey. Oh, I'll see you at three, so. So the question is, what is our responsibility to creating for long? Um, I thought this one was really good. It's showing up and being empathetic, being an empathetic leader, listening to understand, offering to collaborate and volunteer as a member of my community. 
Oh, walk, walk the walk. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Any first reaction? I also like to include um, one, we're not afraid of the silence, I should say that. <laughs> But also, if there's something that's said that you may not necessarily um, have a response to, but can agree to or feel something mm -hmm. for, we can do something for that as well. Uh, a head nod or like a, you know, a yes or a, mm -hmm. a lot of snaps, let's do the snaps. I, you know, sometimes I can't do it. <laughs> I gotta think about it so hard. But that could be that was a, not too much, Robbie. You laughed really hard. <laughs> Sorry. All right. Um uh let's do um five, Corey. Right. So question five. What does it mean to belong to a community? Um, someone who wrote in purple says to feel included, like you're inside not watching from outside mm -hmm. and supported. Mm -hmm. And then, um, I know I should have picked this. Wow. Okay. Um, part of the team, welcomed as I am, con con contributions are valued and perspectives slash mm -hmm. needs are considered. Any initial reactions? I know folks really enjoy um, to feel included, like they're inside, not watching from outside. Mm -hmm. But anyone like to speak to that? Zoom as well. And Zoom, feel free to unmute yourself. Oh, thank you so much. Let's see here. Number five, to not live fault, to not live in a fear to feel welcome, to not live in fear, to feel welcome, feeling accepted as I am. Yeah. I think not living in fear is really important. So I'll just speak to this one, specifically with the students that I work with, working with a lot of queer and trans students, specifically my trans and non-binary students, with everything that's going on with policy and legislation. Um, I have a lot of students who are like, I don't know if I will have the same affirming care and access to affirming care that I have now, and I don't know what that means for me. Um, and even on a, I don't want to say a smaller scale, but not dealing with policy like, oh, I'm scared of being outed or I'm scared of coming out to my parents. Um, so being able to really cultivate a community where my students can just come and be themselves is something that I'm constantly working towards because it's really a, a, a thing for my, my babies is what I call them. Yeah. So thank you for that, Selena and Justina. I do want to talk about the comment on five about the visual of being on the inside and, and not looking from the outside. Mm -hmm. And I feel like we all had a response to it because it gives a visual around what it could feel like to not belong. It's like that longing of looking in somewhere and the feeling that's associated with it. And I'm just, when I think about it, I'm like, wow, a person could go or be in a community or come into a community and feel that way, even though they're there, even though they're, they're in the inside, but they still feel like they're looking from outside. How do we bring them inside? Like never all the way. What you say? Never alone, but lonely. Right. Exactly. Okay. Feel like belonging is internal work as well. Oh, yeah, but show <laughs> <laughs> any responses yeah. to that? Yep, so yeah. I yeah. Where it started. yeah, why? Because even if you're invited to a party, if you don't personally make the effort to show up to the party, it's you know, I think that's one, of, it's a one way, it's a two way street, right? Like, I can include you and I can be inclusive if I want, but if you yourself don't allow yourself to be included, then there won't be belonging on either end because there's no like meat in the middle, you know. And I think that's the important part. And another thing, too, that I thought about when you mentioned that, you know, everyone here, regardless of how we look, we all have felt some kind of experience where we didn't feel like we belong, right? Because belonging is so multifaceted where it might be women that can't have children and they look at 
logs, you know, and then it's like, oh, I can't be, I'm not included in that community. Mm -hmm. Or it could be, um, you know, uh, socioeconomic mm -hmm. communities and circles. And so I think it's so inclusive, it, it being included is, yeah, I'm like, I lost the words, but it, it doesn't stereotype. Right, yeah. like you could be black, you can be Hispanic, you can be white, you can be male. Feel, yeah, it doesn't discriminate because you did not feel welcomed in many spaces, regardless of who you are. And I think to her point, it's also an internal work. It's like, why don't I feel included in this space? Yeah. And what can I do to make it better? You know, but yeah. To your point, you said showing up. Showing up is not just physically showing up, it's it's all of the other pieces of showing up. When you were saying that I um I had this moment where I um there's like a group called Child of Cat Lady. <laughs> Child of Cat Ladies for Kamala. <laughs> and I went to the Zoom call on a Sunday and there were eleven thousand people like on Zoom with their cats. Just like, <laughs> I'm the child of cat lady. I love this. Um and it was just like a moment of Sometimes you don't need to be physically in a space, mm -hmm. but the other ways that you can be in a shirt, so that idea of showing up, mm -hmm. um, it can be really powerful when you really let it fully envelop you. And I think that's often the the missing ingredient that I think people look at when they when they have conversations of where do I belong? Belonging isn't a linear, it's not a binary, it's it it can exist in multiple facets if we allow it to. Mm -hmm. And it's that intentionality aspect too. Like you want to intentionally do all these things. Yeah, and I think going back to the idea of a lot of the internal work, and again, I think it's just because I mostly work with students in a workplace, and often it's um, for students, they often haven't had a job before, or they haven't had a um, job before. Mm -hmm. um, I think they don't always know like what that looks like. What does it look like to belong at work? How do I show up? How do I advocate for myself? Or am I being like welcomed in or invited and I don't even realize like that's what's happening for me right now in space? How can you know how can and so I think there's an important role we can play as like just like modeling that like hey you're being called in or you're being welcomed or you're being given this opportunity and it's a chance to make that belonging for yourself or to take that role for yourself. We you also know, have a hand in the chat yeah. as well, just so you know. I and want I love the conversation that we're having, but we only have an hour in this room. <laughs> <laughs> so what I will say though, we do have some parking That's lot easy. areas around here. So at any point, you know, I know we're some folks are taking notes. So if you want to write them down for people to review later on. This is a great time to kind of insert that in there, but I do want to move on so that we can get to the dialogue. All right. Mm -hmm. Robin, one last thing. I, I think that if if there's any change we also want to um leave as we transition to this next component, belonging is a risky thing. We don't think of it as a risky thing. It requires a mutual engagement on on, on in communities and parties. And it can feel very vulnerable, and sometimes we can get hurt in, in the space around belonging because as quickly as we belong, we can feel like we don't belong. We can feel a sense of, of, of loneliness or any number of things. And so when it comes to students, we have to remember that, that they have to take it as they go, and they also have to, to create that sense of safety in those dynamics. So it's just because we say, hey, we go up all the 80 flags. And we say you belong here. It doesn't mean that that's that's who belonging. They have to they have to take this the same way. They have to build trust the same way. They have to do a lot of things in life. And we do the same things as well. You know, so I just want to put that out there because we don't often think of belonging as risky. We think of it as something that should happen. Mm -hmm. So um, we wanted to engage you on a dialogue um, in a space of asking you two questions. So the first question is, how do we create a sense of belonging for students? What does that look like? And so in a dialogue, please feel free to share out, um, look to your neighbor and share, um, but we'd really love to, to hear your thoughts. Here's your 
Also in the chat from Justina, we have be present and listen, especially for the unsaid. Wendy said by asking questions. Lori said by, wel by welcoming ourselves and model the behavior we wish to see. Um, and Wendy followed up in listening. Yeah, go for it. Think about my dog's hierarchy of needs, right? Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. yeah. You have to make sure physically that you can be easier. Mm -hmm. At least the ankle needs to be hurt. Like, that's what I said, everyone's going to have to So if you're not even feeling physically safe, you know, or even psychologically safe, mm -hmm. so that's why I'm more like, students are trying to find you, right? And so yeah. you can show those basic needs are met first, and then you can really ask. Yeah. yeah. Okay. yeah. Okay. First off, students don't feel safe, especially in this global environment. Yeah. 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 Selena added reinforcing a safe environment for all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. to stop. I think even like building off of that, you know, understanding where some gaps are, or, like, and, like. Serving where the gaps are, or hearing from students where the gaps are, and then when you have the space to give and to fill those gaps in, like doing it, you know, like being selfless in that way and making that space, or making like even specifically contributing to students, like right? giving the AU pantry, or mm -hmm. you know, really contributing to the ways that students can meet their those basic needs. Yeah, if we can all do that a little bit. Yeah. How many of you are familiar with the Mary Nest? mindset list. Yeah. So every year they do a mm -hmm. um they create a list of what the incoming class yeah. their framework is. And so these last couple of classes that have come in, LeBron James is the most famous athlete that they've ever known. Facebook has existed their entire life. And so that idea of like knowing who your audience is, because again, from a mad low hierarchy of needs, like you need to establish a safe environment, but you need to know who you're talking to. You mm -hmm. need to know how they're framing all of this around them. So the information you're giving is actually landing somewhere. It's not the same, a connection. Yeah. Um, there is something on the right just the last eight days, also understanding what resources you have, but they always have to know to then make that connection. Like yes, it is a it's so important for me to understand like hey what from a student assistant that was looking like hey what's my goal and like working towards of course like in their personal matter what all is going on but then to connect them with the correct resources like hey I need to find a student oh let me not ask from the university who else is looking for a job you don't have to go too far it might have happened so just yeah I mean I've learned a couple of resources giving somebody a session but I was like okay um, but I think there's just so much that even we as we offer, but we all like some of the things are all working so much battles that we just don't mm -hmm. know. And this program is really just like we have no idea. Yeah. So yeah, connecting those dots. Absolutely. Um, the next piece are um, what are the challenges in how we go about establishing that belonging? So we've talked about what needs to be there, but where do you see the challenges? And before we move <laughs> forward, I just want to note that we're running down on time. <laughs> um, but the, the dialogue already is feeling so fruitful. I'm going to mm -hmm. take one, two comments from this section and then move on to some of the resources. But again, like we're here on campus. Mm -hmm. yeah. And all of this information will be shared yes. and be accessible to you. Mm -hmm. um, I was thinking of it kind of actually a challenge, so I'm, thanks for moving on to that question. Yeah. Um, I know that the challenge that I encounter is we spend a lot of time working one-on-one -on -one in the groups with our students to like get their feedback and involve them in, you know, the decisions we make and hear how that's affecting them and hear what they need, but that often the resources that we have to respond to them, like as student employees are pretty limited. Am 
might be limited because of what AU has. It might be limited because of what, you know, our department budget has or what, you know, so often our students have really good ideas and they'll say, oh, I really just wish things were handled this way or I could have this thing. And the only answer I have to them is like, I do too, but like, I can't make that happen. And even my boss can't make that happen. Um, and so obviously, you know, we always need to advocate for them. We always need to pass that information over the chain, but very often, especially as the immediate managers of, of the students who are the ones they're talking to, there's not, there's not a great answer for them. There's not a lot I can give them. And so how do I still make sure that they feel heard and that they feel valued when I can't actually give them what they want or give it to them in the way or the time frame that they're looking for? Okay, now I'll hop on it. No, go for it. Yes. Um, so one of the challenges that I, so I'm an admin in an uh, industry department. We are always hearing that history students want to be a part of the history student community. Um, and coming off the pandemic and continuing, um, we've been experiencing a real, like, a huge decrease in engagement from our students. So we are always hearing like, oh, we'd love for you to have more events and come and throw events. And we don't know. Yeah. Oh, oh, no. This is something that okay. like, we're kind of experimenting like, what about something like this? Is that is that going to be interesting? Are you interested? What about something like this? Mm -hmm. So one of the challenges is with the extremely limited budget that we have is how are we going to create these opportunities for the students to come together and, and meet each other? Because one of the things that we hear is I don't meet my fellow history majors until my third year. And so the challenge of like creating that space and then also being like, please come, please come to this event. Um, that's what, that was our major challenge. Thank you. And we have one in the chat from Selena that says not everyone is coming from the same background or same experiences and may not be on the same page on what belonging means. And we have a 100 emoji in the chat. <laughs> yeah. I feel like that's key, you know, being able to all have one definition, but there isn't really one definition when it comes to belonging because it's an individual thing. The other thing that I wanted to say before we move on in response to some of the challenges is that one, with students, I always find being transparent with them really helps them to recognize that we're in it with them. Mm -hmm. And so if we can do that for them, then there's a level of acceptance that happens with when it comes to like, there's yeah. all the, so much I can do, baby, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and then there's a different um, approach at that point. It's more like we're working together now instead of I'm, I'm working for you or around you or about you. So I, I think that that could be helpful. Um, I wanted to uh, also just say we're running low on time, so we have to move on to the takeaways. Quinn, take it away. Absolutely. So. Um, we have a couple of printouts. Um, obviously, don't have enough for everyone, but I am happy to email anyone who would like a copy along with the presentation. But some of the dialogical tools that we wanted to share with you are ones that you probably know. So the solar method, this is how you engage with someone you're having a dialogue with. So sitting in an upright position, being open, leaning in, being attentive, and responding. Um, Intent versus impact, power dynamics. You get the hand up. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry about that, y'all. Most people are here. <laughs> with the students, they've been like, wait a minute. It's back to dialogue. <laughs> right. So these are some of our closing thoughts. Um, Again, this will be given out to you. Can you go to the next one? Because the mm -hmm. next one is the most important part. Okay, so some things that CDI is doing that we would love to have in partnership or be in partnership with you all. We are um, doing CDI Peer Educator Academy this fall. So we're looking for partners. We are hiring four peer educators. Mm -hmm. uh, we got the application. They are really excited to be peer educators. <laughs> um, with that, we wanna have some partnerships in terms of the impact circles or the dialogue circles that we will be doing and just kind of engaging across um, with this. Also, please scan here for our newsletter, CDI Insights. This is where you'll learn all of the information about what's going on with CDI. I'm in charge of the newsletter. 
Um, so I try to make sure that I put in things that revolve around DC, along with AU and other organizations on campus. If you want something in our newsletter, please let us know. Email the newsletter at American.edu. The newsletter. <laughs> um, and then email us. Go to our website um, for any further information. Thank you all so much for coming to our session. <laughs>